This meeting is now called to order. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Here. Mrs. Cons? Here. Mr. Lavalley? Here. Mr. Salt? Here. Mr. Temby? Here. The Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Colonel Sullivan. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic in which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Matson, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to remove from the consent agenda? Are there any items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Board quote is Colonel Sullivan. All right, good evening, everyone. It's a long quote. I won't read it all uh, to you, but... It, please read it. You want me to read it? Yes. Okay. It is not the critic who counts, not the person who points out how the strong one stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the one who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends oneself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if one fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so the one's place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So as Teddy Roosevelt, he was traveling through Africa and then Europe doing diplomacy and hunting. I'm not sure which, which order that, that was, but uh, it was back in 1910, he gave this, this speech called Citizenship in the Republic uh, at the Sorbonne University in Paris. And I like this particular excerpt of the speech because I think it applies to everyone's efforts in the, the room and online today. And the speech is 112 years old, so I took some poetic liberty and adjusted some of the pro pronouns to make it a little more inclusive and appropriate for today. But we all have our individual arenas that we face in our our daily lives and specific to this setting i just wanted to say i admire all the parents all the teachers all the the staff all the district 20 citizens that are here in the audience today because you're not just sitting at home worrying or complaining about an issue but you're actually taking action and coming here and being part of the process for those who are going to be part of the, the public comment you've taken the time you've researched you've prepared your comments and you're willing to deliver those in front of everybody here and i just want to say i admire mr gregory the cabinet the teachers the staff and all the elected board members here because I know having been a part of this group for a year now, fully confident that every one of them are extraordinary teammates doing absolutely everything they can to give the best po possible educational opportunity to our students, our teachers, and our staff. So I just urge you in spirit of this quote that if you get that chance to dare greatly, then, then go out there and do it. Thank you. Thanks, Colonel Sullivan. Um, next is introduction of new administrators. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Mr. Smart, please. I don't think so. It says don't press the button. Okay, there we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it always seems to start off that way when I come up here for these things, doesn't it? Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, tonight, we have two folks that we're going to introduce to you as recommendations for administrative positions in our district. And they have met all the requirements. Uh, they have also went through a rigorous uh, uh, interview evaluation process where they uh, they were vetted and um, have completed that. So I'm going to start off with, I'm going to introduce Amy Griffin, who is being recommended as the Eagle View uh, Middle School Interim Assistant Principal. And she is joined this evening by Chris, her significant other. Amy holds a Bachelor of Arts in Education from the University of Michigan. And go blue, I think that's what they say, right? Go blue. Uh, and a Master's of Arts in Education and Educational Leadership from Regis University. Amy started her educational career here in D20 at Discovery Canyon Campus Middle School as a language and literature uh, teacher and continues to serve at DCC Middle School. She has served as a team lead and currently serves as the interim dean at Discovery Canyon Campus Middle School. We are pleased to present Amy to you tonight for the position of Eagle View Middle School Interim Assistant Principal. Amy, is there anything you'd like to say? All right, come on. Uh, 
I would like to thank everyone at DCC for all of the opportunity they've given me uh, to learn and grow as a leader in a very student-centered and co collaborative environment. And I'm really looking forward to going to Eagle View and taking what I've learned in a very similar student-centered and collaborative atmosphere. Um, I have been in D20 since I moved to Colorado, first as a parent of one of my children who just ran from work and is standing at the door. Uh, and uh, then as a teacher, and I'm very excited to continue to grow in the community that I call home. Thank you. And he made it. Here he is. Thanks. All right, the next person I'd like to introduce is Kaylee Maxwell, who is being recommended as the Air Academy High School Interim Assistant Principal slash Athletic Director. Uh, Kaylee is here by herself tonight. Um, one thing is she does coach lacrosse, so we're now needed a lacrosse coach. So if anybody wants to step up and coach lacrosse, we'd be happy to, happy to help you do that. Uh, Kaylee holds a Bachelor of Science in Physical Education, Teaching and Coaching from Long Island University and a Master of Arts in Education and Leadership uh, from uh, the University of Northern Colorado here in Greeley. Um, Kaylee started her educational career here in District 2 as uh, at Panorama Middle School as a PE teacher, and she has served as a PE teacher at Air Academy High School for over five years. Kaylee also serves as the head girls of the car coach, as I said, um, and we are pleased to present Kaylee to you tonight as a position for the position of Air uh, Academy High School Interim Assistant Principal Athletic Director. Kaylee, anything you'd like to say? Okay, she has a 30 minute speech ready. Um, I would just like to thank everyone for the opportunity. I'm super excited to get started. Um, I'm actually going to be heading out as soon as I can to a D meeting at DCC with the athletic director. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to the board. Thank you to the administration at Air Academy. Can't wait to get started. Thanks. And at this time, I think we have filled all our admin positions so far. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smart. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Um, what we do now is we will take a little break so we can say hi, congratulate. We actually will vote on you in a few minutes. Uh, you don't need to stay. Um, almost no one does when I, you can if you want to, but uh, uh, we just want to take a five minute break now and just to congratulate. So without further ado, five minutes.
All right. Ms. Cortez, do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? This evening we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six individuals signed up to speak. I have seven, but. We had one cancellation. Oh, OK, gotcha. That's fine. Um, the board welcomes public comments. In the interest of respecting the time of all who are present, speakers must have signed up to address the board prior to 4 p.m. today, and they must limit the remarks to two minutes or less. We also ask speakers to address the board and not others in the room. All speakers will be notified of the remaining time via the mounted monitors behind the dais. When the time has ended, the microphone will turn off. Supplemental written materials can be given to the security guards who are seated in the hallway outside the boardroom and they will be delivered to the board secretary. Profanity or any disrespectful behavior will not be tolerated. We greatly value all comments from the public. However, the board will not respond this evening. Our first speaker is Kathleen Troca. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Troca. My family has lived in D20 for almost 30 years and our children attend D20 schools. We have the unfortunate position of both living near the proposed Sunset Amphitheater and also having a kid at DCC. It recently came to our attention that this venue has virtually no parking and will be paying the district to use the DCC lot. We think this is a terrible idea to rent out our school parking lot and bus 8,000 concert goers throughout the neighborhood. It will only encourage them to park closer and walk. Our safety and property values will be directly affected by your decision to accept these funds. I realize that Dr. Smith has given us the details I know that you believe all the issues have been addressed, but honestly, how will any of this be enforced? By not renewing the contract? All it takes is one incident, one shootout between drunk attendees, one kid hit by a drunk driver. For an institution whose sole purpose is to help kids thrive, you are selling out our kids and our neighborhood's safety for a fraction of what's necessary to successfully run our district. It will be a bell that you can unring. And where will you draw the line in allowing local businesses to rent out our facilities? Will anyone be turned away? Renting the parking lot is not an equivalent to hosting Lego Robotics Camp over the summer or allowing churches to use the facilities on Sunday morning. This is a pivotal moment for the district. I believe that the school should not be funded by private companies. There's a conflict of interest. As someone that ran a campaign for the last Board of Education election, I know large sums of dark money were funneled into some of your campaigns. I find it hard to believe that that money won't come with strings attached. You as board should be representing the homeowners and the parents, not big business. The district's belief that sunset developers can be counted on to do the right thing is naive. Their purpose is to make money. We've had a front row seat on how developers in this town have made promises and then not followed through. Please reconsider allowing them to use our school parking lot for their venue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Mattis. Hello. Nicole, thank you for your help yesterday with IC. I got our year reported. <laughs> and thank you for last month's meeting and you're bringing up the topic of the value of civility at the podium. I was concerned last fall when you were silent about the issues in the atrium where some people in a local group made some racist remarks and threatened D20 families. I appreciate the prior board's decision to remove the atrium as overflow for civility and the safety of D20 families. During the same message exchange last fall, uh, you told me you fully supported your husband using the phrase, let's go Brandon at boarding meetings, even though it did not benefit the civil discourse. Now that you have had several months in your board position, I thank you for realizing that civility is what is best and safest for all. Last month, you said, we want to set the best example for our students. I agree wholeheartedly. That is why I hope the discussion continued on the other side of the dais. So when Aaron and other board members decide to attend future religious events in their personal capacity, you are each aware that setting the best example for our students is by not mocking D20 families. Aaron, thank you for finally responding to my email regarding why you chose not to sign the declaration from the PPLD's board, up board's public rebuttal against some of the false accusations made in the Gazette editorial several months, about, months ago. The PPLD board statement says, we collectively stand firm that PPLD should be a bastion for democracy that protects First Amendment rights for all. You chose not to sign this letter. You said you stand with accessibility and providing books for the community. I thank you for that. 
This does concern me though, because the Gazette did report a couple months ago that you want to blacklist and whitelist books. I chose purposely to email your D20 email rather than your PPLD address because both positions are directly connected. If you're not aware, several D20 school libraries are served by PPLD. There is a big difference in providing accessibility versus standing firm to protect the First Amendment rights for all. I wish all students and staff a happy and safe school year. Our next speaker, and Jed, I hope I get your last name right, Fuqua? Ah. Ah, thank you. Good evening, my name is Jed Fuquay. Uh, I'm a father of two TCA kids. Uh, I'm, mainly, I'm mainly concerned about the proposed arrangements made with our taxpayer dollars for District 20 school parking spaces to be rented for profit uh, for a neighboring proposed Sunset Amphitheater. For public documents, they're needing approximately 1,204 parking spaces. I, as a parent, would like to request a separate public hearing voicing concerns with you. Um, however, before this public hearing, I would like to request two things. First, all the details uh, and arrangements in written form uh, to be published to all D20 impacted parents of students attending TCA and DCC. Uh, number two, parents of active students should be able to vote yes or no on these agreements because this will result in direct impact to us as parents when we leave the school in the afternoon and after school events regarding traffic. Um, this isn't just a one-time rental of a soccer field. Uh, we, we are actually tied at the hip to help sustain a developer's parking deficiency. Concerts of this magnitude are known for drugs and other illicit uh, paraphernalia. I don't want my kids exposed to or have to deal with finding such things in walking paths, parking lots, play areas, and surrounding border uh, regions between it, TCA, and the amphitheater is very close. If parking is built on premise for this amphitheater, this would solve much of the, these concerns, pulling localized volumes of traffic into that venue uh, and safeguarding it with the proper police in that one place, away from our kids, away from the school. Thank you, your time's up. Our next speaker is Jody Fletcher. Good evening. Title IX opens as with on the basis of sex, which defines not only gender, but also identity. There has been an open attack in our community on LGBTQA plus students, and they have legal protections codified in law. You are moving down a slippery and very dangerous road if you try to eliminate clubs such as Alley's Liberty Student Union and groups that embrace and celebrate diverse student populations. This is not only a violation of Title IX, but it's also a violation of the Constitution, our precious right to assemble. These violations will be considered arbitrary and capricious. When you no longer make good local education agency decisions, you're opening the door for outside agencies such as the Department of Justice, the Office of Civil Rights, the state, to come in and make these decisions for you. They will come in and they will provide oversight and real adult supervision to make sure that our students are safe and protected. If this is the legacy that you want to leave, please go ahead and by all means do so. Ban these student groups. I honestly prefer that my tax dollars are used to fund educational opportunities, not lawsuits. I did see that there was a Title IX position posted. I don't know if that's a new position in the district, but I think that person is going to be very busy because there's a ton of social media chatter about trying to get these groups shut down because of hate. We need to stop hating. We need to start loving. Career educator, been in this district as an educator. I've been an administrator in two other districts for many, many years. Our job is to love, protect, and keep our kids and our schools safe. And if you are setting a precedent that not doing so is okay based on gender and or identity, then 
we're opening up this district to significant litigation. Our next speaker is Charlotte Johnson. Good evening, my name is Charlotte. I'm the parent of two high school students in D20. I'm also an advanced practice provider in anesthesia at a local hospital. There are many reasons for the district to provide high quality evidence-based sex ed for our middle and high schoolers. The first of which is very straightforward. Colorado law requires it. I've explained this in detail before and will again if necessary. The next reason is that there's plenty of evidence saying that comprehensive sex ed curriculum is more effective than abstinence-based education in reducing sexual activity, number of partners, unprotected intercourse, STIs, and adolescent pregnancy. That's right. Comprehensive curriculum actually leads to teens having less sex than just telling them not to do it. We all have teens, right? <laughs> Third reason is a little more esoteric. For most people, sex ed in middle and high school is the only formal education that they will receive on the topic in their entire lifetimes. Without it, they'll likely never get the information they need for when they are sexually active adults, either trying to not have children or when they are trying to start a family. It's important for the information to be age appropriate. Yes, it's not a green light to have sex before they're ready. It's not explicit instructions on how to have sex, despite what you may have heard. It looks like when you're ready to start a family, this is the medically appropriate information. It looks like when you do become sexually active, this is how to be safe. I want my children to be educated adults. The law does allow for you to opt out. That's your parental right. It's a far easier compromise than it seems. My children's right to have an accurate education doesn't change your right to keep your child home and vice versa. One last thing, before I studied medicine, I was an historian. I studied how to recognize propaganda. You're gonna hear people making claims about grooming, sexualizing our children, etc. They're just trying to scare you, make no mistake. This is sensationalist, fear-mongering propaganda meant to scare well-meaning people. Don't let that baloney drive our curriculum. We're better than that and smarter than that here. Thank you. Our final speaker this evening is Edward Waldrop. Try to work this a little better. I'm still getting used to having hair too, so work with me here. Uh, my name is Dr. Eddie Waldrop. I'm a D20 parent and resident. Uh, and my comments here today are my own and not reflective of any institution. Um, I have learned that the school district has paid over $45,000 to a consultation group called CEI. And I don't want to see another dollar of my taxpayer money going to a consultant group that is trying to impose basically socialism in my daughter's education or anyone else's education. Their stated commitment on their website is to infuse their six tenants into every system that they can. They make the same socialist claims of any outcomes or disparities are due to the system, any gaps in education, anything like this is always the system. It's the only way they kind of think about these things. Um, and this has been debunked so thorough, but so many times at different levels of analyses that it's kind of dumbfounded to see that how this keeps coming back up. Um, they also, they note the disrupting bias in this system. And that's another very socialist and Marxist kind of framework that they work with. Uh, the system, however, is made of people. And I don't believe that our teachers, our administrators, or anyone else are biased against any group, not for a second. Uh, they also want to turn our kids into activists. It says it right there on their, their website, you know, activating our kids. We look to our children being educated to have the barriers removed so they have as much access to equality of opportunity as they possibly can. Uh, we want our children to be taught and uh, not to be taught how to be activists. So I request that any and all ties to CEI be ended immediately and reconceptualizing uh, our strategic plan to improve academic outcomes for all students. And I'd like to thank you for your time and your dedication to our students and to our community. That concludes our speakers for this evening. All right, thank you, Ms. Cortez. Board comments, Ms. Cons. Okay, Mr. Sacalidi has a few <laughs> photos for me. So even the school hasn't started, I was super excited to 
actually be at Rampart yesterday. Mrs. Cloninger was there too, because both of our kiddos are starting ninth grade there. Um, and just to give another shout out, super excited that the AVID program is uh, expanded into early college college programming. So that's why our kids are excited to be there. Um, this is some of our admin and support staff, Mrs. Miller, uh, Allison, I think on the left, Mr. Chamberlain back there and assistant principal welcoming all the freshmen and seniors yesterday with a smile. Um, some of our um, Rampart parent teacher organ or parent organization gals. I think they sold a ton, especially to the freshmen. It was like crickets when the seniors were there. I think they have all their gear, but so they were there all day uh, today and yesterday. I think our brand new principal that we're so happy to have Megan Sanders um, there at Rampart. And then, of course, some senior boys. They started walking by me and I said, did they actually let you take your ID photos like this? <laughs> and they were very proud of themselves for drawing their mustaches. So I thought they were super cute. So I had to take a picture of them. I guess some seniors last year, Air Academy, all dressed in 80s clothes for their ID. So I love when the kids kind of get to have a little leeway to express their uniqueness. So um, that was it. Thank you for the photos. So um, a lot of, I think all of our middle schools and high schools at least had their check-in days this week. So as you can see, there's a lot of excitement and anticipation for all the positive things to come for this year. And um, my call to all of us in the district is let's hold dear to that excitement and anticipation all year long. What we aim at is what we get. Where our thoughts go is what manifests in our lives. It was so exciting to be with all of our new teachers, hundreds of new teachers yesterday at Pine Creek. And we are so thankful for all of them and all of our already existing teachers to be a part of this tremendous community at D20. My wish for all of our teachers and staff this year is that you find more joy than you find troubles that you delight each day in the gifts of children you teach, their humor, their talent, when they master a concept that you were the one able to finally teach them. When needed, advocate for yourself decisively and wisely. None of us should ever let important things left unsaid. Students, my wish for you this year is always hope above all else. Hope in all the opportunities that lay before you. Hope and thrill in learning an awesome new skill or concept, in connecting with someone new that just gets you, in pushing your comfort zone to try clubs and activities, or even just to answer in class when you know the right answer. A wish that we all recognize the humanity and beautiful uniqueness in everyone we come in contact with. My grandma gave me a book when I graduated. I think it was called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and it's all small stuff or that was just one of the chapters that struck me the most. But that sentiment has never left me and I hope all of us in our district hold on to it when we need it. Don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. Every sunrise brings a new beginning to each one of us. When you doubt, find something new to be hopeful for. When you fail, rejoice that you put the effort into trying. When others do well, celebrate them and let it be inspiration for you to achieve all that is possible. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Cons. Colonel Sullivan. Yes, sir, just one quick comment. I want to publicly thank Rich Payne and his security team. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he brought my security forces squadron into training for active shooter training at Air Academy High School. And you know, Air Academy High School and Doug Valley Elementary are different being on a federal institution. And it was the first time my defenders had ever been brought into that training, had over four dozen people there. Hopefully we never have to use it, but the fact that we were brought in and got so much value out of that training, and I think is a very mutual benefit. I just want to say thank you and look forward to more opportunities to cooperate with you and your team. Thanks, Colonel Sullivan. Uh, Ms. Cloninger? If I seem a little bit tired, it's because <laughs> I had my four nephews for the last week, and um, I they're four to 13, and my children are 15 and 17, so 
Um, all of you parents who are getting ready to send littles back to elementary, I mean, what a godsend the next week or so is going to be. Um, that said, I had a lot of um, opportunity to be out and around the, um, the community um, this past couple of weeks since our last meeting. Um, one of the things that I was able to do was um, go down to the downtown area and celebrate pride in this city which I thought was extremely important for um, showing inclusion for our students. But I went there as my own Heather, Arm Heather Cloninger. Um, but I also wanted to be uh, seen as somebody that would always be an ally, and I will. And I also, on the same thought process, I, I was sitting down this last couple of weeks with a couple of friends of mine who um, have spoken at this podium um, in opposition to inclusivity um, and we had a really good dialogue about what that means and, and why I will always be for every single student in this district. Uh, I will stand up for all of your students, all of you that are here in the room and all of you that are listening, but I was, I was elected, I believe, to be a part of this district um, leadership to look over all of your children and you don't have to agree with everything that I do or think, but know that your children are safe with me. Um, we were, we had the opportunity and I also have a couple of pictures. Um, well, I come with slideshows, that's the rest of you copy. No, just kidding, Nicole. <laughs> um, I'm happy to celebrate Rampart. Um, this was a really beautiful shot. Actually, Mr. Temby took it for me. Um, Mr. Temby and myself and Mr. Gregory were able to go up to the Yusafa um, groundbreaking of the Visitor Center and Colonel Sullivan, of course, was there um, uh, to the Yusafa Visitor Center in True North Commons, which will be an amazing um, facility when it's when it's completed. Um, and it was such a beautiful backdrop. And um, there were a lot of people you can scroll through. Um, uh, the mayor, Mayor Southers was there. Lieutenant Governor uh, Primavera was there. And this is General Clark, the superintendent of the um, academy. His daughter actually um, graduated from Air Academy last May. So he's been just a huge help to this district and an advocate. And I promise we looked for you, Will, but you had already left. <laughs> and so this is our, our old liaison. No, we would have made room. <laughs> um, our old liaison, Colonel Johnson, and our current one, uh, Colonel Sullivan, and myself and Mr. Gregory. And it was just a really um, nice, um, I think, well-attended um, groundbreaking. And so I look forward to seeing that when it is the ribbon cutting. I think that's my last picture. Um, then I also just wanted to say that I also um, had the opportunity to go to the new um, licensed staff um, orientation yesterday at Pine Creek. And um, I think some of them looked a little like deer in the headlights and some of them looked very seasoned and, and ready to go. And I hope that after they had their day there and, and in the coming weeks that they will feel very comfortable with being in our district. And I just, I appreciate the, the cabinet who did so much work and put it, their efforts into that. So um, I am grateful for hopefully a, a normal year and um, for the opportunity that our kids have to be back with each other and learning from each other and from good teachers that we have here. So thank you very much for all that you guys bring to the table as well. Thank you, Ms. Kloninger. Mr. Salt. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also was able to attend. I think all of us were at the, uh, the event for the new teachers uh, yesterday. It was a lot of fantastic energy. Uh, we had teachers that have never spent a day in the classroom. We have new teachers or new to the district that have been there for over 30 years and everywhere in between. Uh, we had a uh, D20 alum, we had people from out of state, and I believe, Mr. Cameron, you're going to tell us later about a few that we had that were international too that were coming in. So uh, just a great brand new group of teachers coming in. It was a lot of fun energy, so I was really excited to be part of that. Uh, so thanks for letting us join you. Other than that, I'm just really excited for the school year coming up. We're closing in. Uh, I know the next week we get to go do our 
school tours week after next week two weeks okay it's coming up um but i'm really looking forward to it and getting out there and uh, getting the school year started so that's all i have thank you mr lavalley thank you mr salt mr temby thanks mr lavalley i'm not sure what constitute constitutes normal, but I'm looking forward to a more normal start to the school year in just a few days. It's been quite a journey over the past two years. I'm entering my 28th school year in D20 this fall and couldn't be uh, prouder of this district. I want to publicly recognize our superintendent, senior leadership team, our principals, and our entire staff for not only holding this district together over the past two years, but also keeping us above the fray that has consumed us as a nation since 2020. I'm not sure when and where our country went off the rails in terms of losing our ability to agree or disagree civilly. We've allowed national narratives on both sides of the aisle to stoke fear and apply sweeping generalizations to what heretofore isolated situations that were, resol that were resolved at the site level by reasonable people. I believe we all agree that our primary job here is to prepare our students for post-secondary success. Like almost every school district in the world, we have had some speed bumps due to a global pandemic. The tone and tenor of our meetings is changing. It is palpable and it is heartening. We are now focusing more energy back on student achievement, social and emotional health, dealing with learning loss as the result of the pandemic, retaining and attracting talented team members and much more. Whatever normal is, I welcome it and look forward to all of us being unified on sustaining the excellence in D20. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Temby. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I too attended, uh, by the way, y'all said a lot more than probably I'm gonna say I agree with what y'all said and I appreciated um, your, your words. Um, I It was fascinating, the new hire training. And I remember this from last year. You would think that there'd be a bunch of 22 year olds who are all bright and bubbly. And there are a few to be sure, but there were, I, I, there was a, I think someone who had been teaching for 32 years was there as, as a as a new teacher in D20. Um, and it, it it sort of made me proud to think that um, we are still the district of choice, which is great. Um, we, we just have a wonderful district. We have great current teachers. We're gonna have great new teachers. I only got a chance to visit with a couple of them, but it was just really good to see. And, um, and I, I know that um, I, I think Mr. Smart probably organized a lot of that training, uh, but I know that you all had a hand in it, so I, I really appreciate that. Um, I attended a movie last night. Um, it's called Whose Children Are They? I'm not going to really comment on the movie, but it reminded me of something that it's the parents. And and to the district's credit, I think we do a great job of saying, parents, you have a right to know what's going on in, in your kid's school. And But it reminded me uh, to say, yes, parents, you have a right to know what's going on. Um, and I, I'm very thankful that we have a great district, but it was just a, just a good reminder for me as a, because sometimes we get lost. We think, oh, you know, we're, we're in charge and we're the ones. It's like, eh, it's, you know, we work, we work ultimately for parents, right? The, the rank order here is there is the superintendent and then, then there's us and then above us are, are the parents. And, and I also say taxpayers and voters. Um, but anyways, it was, uh, it was just good. Uh, I think that is all um, I had to say, although this is going to sound like a real weak excuse. You all saw me come in a little bit late. Um, I live off of Baptist Road and I pulled onto the interstate and I look up and there's nothing but red lights. The interstate was basically closed. So I will just say that I did some creative driving um, to get here. <laughs> so in case you're wondering, you know, here's the board president just strolling in, you know, 15 minutes prior. That's that's not normal. But I uh, I just got stuck in bad traffic. So. Without further ado, administrative comments, Mr. Gregory. Yes, thank you. And uh, before I start, I'll apologize if I repeat uh, some of this stuff, but it's there's a lot of important events, so I think much of it is worth repeating. But uh, this week, we welcome back to our principals and assistant principals, uh, our new teachers, counselors, and classified staff to the new school year. On Monday, principals returned for our annual uh, kind of first day back retreat. On Wednesday, as you've heard, nearly 300 new teachers and counselors uh, joined the district to begin their uh, orientation. Uh, and just today we said uh, hello again to our classified staff members. Um, just as a reminder, next week we welcome uh, all 
I'll say returning teachers. I won't use the word old. Uh, our returning teachers come back next week. And then of course, the week after that, where did our students go? Our, student, our students get to come back, get to come back, right? Um, uh, so we're, the, the countdown is, is, is on and, and we're nearing the first day for, for everybody to be back. Uh, last week, I joined thousands of educators from across the state at the annual Colorado Association of School Executives um, conference meeting in Breckenridge. Uh, it was a great conference and I'm proud that uh, District 20 was once again well represented at a statewide event. Um, the conference was kicked off by four very talented Chinook Trail Elementary School fifth graders, uh, Lucas Hine, Colin Wong, Angelina McKinney, and Noah Lee opened the entire conference with by singing the national anthem for these in front of, again, I don't think they realized there was a couple thousand pr people probably in the room and they probably didn't know that there are like six satellite rooms that uh, that their performance was being broadcast into also. So um, they got to open up the conference and they did it uh, with expertise and, and again represented District 20 uh, expertly. Thank you to uh, Mrs. Darpino, the, the school's choir teacher, for leading the group and also for traveling up there on our summer vacation day to be with, be with her students. Additionally, Chinook Trail Elementary School principal, Mr. Pat Shoemaker ended his leadership term as the president of that organization. Uh, and he did so by giving some very inspirational comments to all of the administrators in the room. Uh, Mr. Shoemaker represented the district with, uh, and I wanna say this, professionalism, uh, dignity and expertise this past year. And I wanna thank him for accepting this role in addition to his role as principal, uh, as a leader in, in education in Colorado. And also assistant principal, Ms. B.J. Campbell, uh, assistant principal at Chinook Trail Elementary School, uh, participated on a uh, one of the breakout sessions on a panel uh, that was discussing uh, voice uh, in minority educators. So all of that was about Chinook Trail Elementary School, essentially, right, uh, at a statewide level. Uh, Rampart High School junior Izzy Stark is bringing home a gold medal this summer. She was a member of Team USA's U19 19 and under volleyball team. Last week, the team competed in the Pan Am Cup and won the gold. And you may remember that name. I've spoken many times about Miss Stark over the last few years uh, and her sister. Uh, through the All Kids Bike Program, Academy Endeavor Elementary School received bikes, helmets, and curriculum that teaches kindergarten students how to ride a bike. During their PE classes, students will start to learn how to ride without training wheels and how to safely cross roads and ride bikes safely. Uh, congratulations to Academy Endeavor. And I should say that's, we have several elementary schools now that are participating in that, in that program. And uh, lastly, under the school recognition title and also under the, maybe the heading of this just in, um, Eagle View eighth grade treble, the Eagle View eighth grade treble choir has been selected to perform at the Colorado Music Educators Association annual conference this coming January uh, down here at the Broadmoor. Eagle View is uh, one of just three middle school choirs that were selected from the state of Colorado um, to perform or, or to receive this honor after submitting an audition at the end of last school year. They will get to perform a concert that showcases the choir and their talents. Uh, they also get to discuss rehearsal methods and techniques and shares District 20 student voices with music educators from across the state. So again, Another um, another way District 20 is is being represented across the state, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, a couple updates. <clears throat> First, um, last spring there was a lot of discussion about um, uh, changing the rampart parking lot, the flow, and and things like that. Some of you had heard some of that discussion, and in fact, you heard some of our plans. I wanted to give you an update. Um, but as you know, board, after engaging a third party consultants to observe and review the flow of traffic in the Rampart parking lot, we developed a plan based on the recommendations uh, this firm provided. Uh, the associated timeline identified completion prior to the start of, of this school year. Uh, last spring, we submitted our redesigned plan to the city of Colorado Springs and received approval uh, in a timely manner. I'll put it that way. Uh, after that, um, 
we submit the plan or the plan then goes to uh, Colorado Springs Utilities for stormwater review. If any of you are familiar with any of these processes, they can be quite long. Um, but in short, uh, it's been sitting there since. Uh, and we have not gotten, uh, and I won't just say approval, but comment even if there's some issue with it. We have not received comment uh, and it's still waiting for comment or approval. So if you go to Ramparts, you will see that it looks very similar to the way it has been, uh, which was not our plan, which was not our intention. Uh, and as soon as we can get something going with the stormwater, uh, and I have said that any way I can help or anybody in here can help, that would be great um, to get this thing moving because it's, I mean, frankly, I'll just say it's minimal change to anything that has to do with stormwater. A couple of medians will be removed, but other than that, there's not a lot of pervious or impervious changes to the to the ground. So um, the principal, uh, Ms. Concha, Ms. Sanders earlier, uh, they have agreed that they will start uh, um, they will start using human beings uh, to direct the flow of traffic commensurate to what the recommendation was, but the, the actual construction parts, curves and gutters and all that stuff uh, won't be there. So we'll try to do it, redirect the flow uh, using humans to start the school year. And if any of you are Rampart student drivers or parents, then please help us with that and follow the, the it's really for student safety uh, and traffic flow uh, to get people in and out more quickly in a safer way. So if you can help follow those uh, Miss Sanders directions, that would be helpful until the parking lot can be changed, uh, construction or physically changed. Uh, second update, uh, you'd heard us uh, uh, at the dais and work sessions speak of um, potentially um, uh, mill levy overrides uh, or a mill levy override question on the ballot uh, this November. Uh, and I just wanted to update where we are on that. After reviewing uh, polling results, uh, we, Ms. Cortez led an effort to uh, get information from the community and we did the, uh, a polling sample of our community. So after reviewing those results, um, recognizing what is happening with the economy and inflation and possible recession and recognizing the need that there is a uh, further need to educate uh, both internally and externally. We're deferring an MLO ballot question to November 2023. Uh, this will allow us to better educate staff, the community and board regarding the driving forces, um, issues and the needs of the school district. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Can the, the event that at, uh, at the Broadmoor in January, I, I assume there will be a concert for that. Um, I humbly ask Ms. Matson if you could do a board call for that because I, I think I attended one of those a couple years ago and it was awesome and I, and I think a lot of us would like to go. So um, that would be great. All right, consent agenda. We need a motion to approve the following resolutions. Resolution 241-22, approval of matters relating to administrative staff license. Resolution 242-22, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. Resolution 243-22, approval of matters relating to licensed staff, license support, slash special services provider. Resolution 244-22, approval of matters relating to classified staff. Resolution 245-22, acceptance of annual monitoring report for GP 4.0 governance commitment. Resolution 246-22, approval of monitoring report evaluation for GP 4.0 governance commitment. Resolution 247-22, acceptance of the annual monitoring report for GP 4.1 composition of the board and the monitoring report evaluation for the same. Resolution 249-22, acceptance of annual monitoring report for GP 4.2 governing styles and values and the uh, monitoring report evaluation for the same. Resolution 251-22, acceptance of annual monitoring report for GP 4.3 board dis job description and the monitoring report evaluation for the same. Resolution 253-22, acceptance of annual monitoring report for GP 4.4 board meetings and the monitoring report evaluation for the same. Resolution 255-22, approval of Citizens Bond Oversight Committee CBOC membership. Resolution 256-22, approval of contract for special services provider services. Approval of the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from June 16th, 2022. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Cloninger? Aye. 
Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. There are no items pulled for consent. Uh, next thing is board development. Report on the CBOC, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee, Mr. Gregory. Yes, I believe we'll just turn it right over to Mr. Brockway. I will remind everyone while he's making his way to the podium that Mr. Brockway uh, is still a parent. I won't say was a parent, but his role as parent has changed uh, over this his term uh, because he's been serving this role since 2016. And in that time, his kids have aged in our different schools and different places, but he is one of the few remaining original members which probably explains why he has to come up every couple of months and talk at the podium. Uh, but one of the few original members of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. Thank you, Mr. Brockway. Thank you. And, uh, happy to be here tonight. Uh, our group recently met uh, July 20th at Pine Creek High School. Our meeting was led by Chris Gerhardt, uh, new here, uh, who briefed us on the financial activity for three months ending uh, July 15. Uh, we're pleased at this meeting to welcome Aaron Salt as our new Board of Education Liaison. Appreciate Aaron's participation in our group. Um, the first report we looked at, the May 15th bond building fund report, had a small increase, just about 24,000 of expenditures and encumbrances compared to April. Uh, this increase is largely offset by interest earnings of about $14,000. Um, those interest earnings are, are growing uh, as rates are going up in the market. So we're benefiting from that on the deposit side. Um, so that's, that's a good thing that offsets some of our cost. Uh, July 15 uh, building fund report wasn't much more exciting. We spent $44,000 of uh, money in that month. Um, and those increases were offset by interest earnings of about 26,000. And also this thing called city sales tax reimbursements of 32,000. Um, the latter, the sales tax reimbursements, uh, we discussed a little more thoroughly at the meeting. And uh, this is a, and, and kind of how the process and the paperwork works with the city of Colorado Springs. Um, the district, through its diligence of submitting for these sales tax reimbursements, has received about $50,000 to date. Um, the exciting part is there's probably about a million dollars total that's expected to be received um, from monies that have already been spent on bond projects. So uh, as we work through that paperwork with the city, those, those monies are coming and will go back into the bond fund. Uh, for the July 15 report, uh, there was a modest increase of about $140,000 in expenditures and encumbrances, and that also was offset by interest earnings of about $34,000 and some more sales tax collections of $6,000. Um, as the meeting concluded, the CBOC was given a tour of the pool at Pine Creek and the stadium at Pine Creek. Uh, the pool construction is expected to be completed in the spring of 2023, and the stadium a little sooner, uh, August of this year, as improvements are expected to be done. Um, as the $230 million 2016 approved bond project stands, as of July 15, there's about $19.8 million more work to do. And in our contingency fund, kind of matching up against that $19.8 million is $3.4 million in the contingency fund. So that covers about 17% of the upcoming work. Much of the upcoming work in that $19.8 million resides in the facility audit category, about 3.7 million of work to do there, 2.6 million in the technology infrastructure, and then the additional board approved projects that were added. Um, and I talked last quarter about this, about the, the things we were able to do because of the premium at which the bonds were issued. But some of those additional board approved projects totaled about $6.4 million. Um, it appears that with the smaller number of bond language projects yet to complete, and as well as the board approved additional projects, um, there are al allocated funds for all of these things um, and that these should be mostly completed over the next 12 to 24 months. So we can kind of see the end, the end in sight here. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for October and I'll brief the Board of Education soon after that. So happy to field any questions. I can never pass up an opportunity to thank you, Mr. Brockway, for, for your hard work. You're a volunteer. You've been on this you know, forever, and, and I know I got to be on CBOC, and it's always fun just to see. And, and I said this before, I'm going to say it again. This passed in 2016. Who knew how much a pool was really going to cost? And, and we are 
right down to the to the end and we're we're building the pool and we're not having we had to do a couple of modifications but it's eight lanes it's beautiful we've got we've been able to do what we we told the voters and the taxpayers that we would do and i think that's important to say that thank you thank you thank you and I, I think that's an accomplishment for everybody to be proud of. Absolutely. Anyone else? Thank you. Mr. LaValle, if I, if I might real quick. Please. You can go ahead and go, Mr. Brockway. Um, this this report I just want, was 47 pages long. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knew why. If you look at it, it's, it's really three reports. It's a report since Mr. Brockway hasn't been back for three months. It's a report through May, the middle of May, then the report, the same report duplicated through the middle of June, then the same report duplicated through the middle of July. And um, I would just say if it's okay with the board, uh, not a resolution, not a vote, but the next time we, uh, Mr. Brockway comes back, we could just give the latest, since it's a, it's a cumulative report, if we just present the most recent months, it will include all of that prior data uh, and we could cut down the report from 47 to a third of that, essentially, uh, if the board's OK with that. Yeah, I, I, I know how Mr. LaValle was going to vote. Um, uh, I, I knew his, his perception of it, but thank you. Uh, and it's no, Ms. Allen, it's nothing against the report. It's just, it's really long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Um, you know, they used to be monthly reports. Yeah. And then they went uh, every two months, now quarterly. So the latest will give you the, the the latest data. And if you ever need anything else, we can always supply that. We'll still maintain it. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. A couple little motherhood things. Um, we have 15 attendees online. And when I, I'm going to take the hit on this because this was sent to me and I missed it. Um, but we're going to have to redo one little thing. And Mr. Temby, you were correct. I read June 16th and it's supposed to be July 16th. So what's that? Oh, OK, sorry, July 21st. See, I messed it up still. Yeah, July 21st. So may we have a motion to approve the Board of Education regular meeting minutes from 21 July 2022? So moved. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mrs. Cons? Aye. Mr. Lavalley? Aye. Mr. Salt? Aye. Mr. Temby? Aye. Thank you. Again, I'll, I'll take the hit on that one. Um, next one is building fund update. Mr. Gregory. Mr. Garnhart, please. Well, great. Thank you uh, for allowing me the opportunity to give you an update on the construction work that we did this summer. It was a very busy summer and all has gone pretty well. No real bumps in the road from my perspective. Uh, so I've got a slideshow. Uh, you'll probably see some some photos that will look a little bit repetitive. Uh, a lot of roofs that we've done and it's great stuff though. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna start off with the facilities audit projects. Next slide, please. Okay, so what you'll see in this uh, slide is a couple of photos of the demolition and removal of the Prairie Hills Elementary School boilers. Uh, the one on the top is with the boilers and the pumps and all the piping removed. Uh, the one on the, the lower right portion of the slide there is what it looks like once they tear the boilers apart and set it outside before they take and recycle all the metal parts. Next slide, please. And then these are what the new boilers look like. Next slide, please. And this is the two red items in this slide are the pumps. And then you'll see the boilers again. Next slide, please. And then you start to see the piping connected. They're almost complete with this. They've got some insulation to put in on the piping and a little bit of uh, some of the controls to put in and then they'll have that wrapped up by the end of next week. Next slide, please. Now we'll get into these roofing projects. So the first one I'll talk about is uh, some roof that we replaced at Discovery Canyon campus. Uh, this view shows uh, if you look at the highlighted yellow areas, those are the two sections of the roof that we replaced at DCC. So it's not the whole roof. Next slide, please. And these are just some progress photos taken at different angles on the bigger portion that was shown on the previous slide. Next slide, please. And th this is more like what it looks like when it's complete. They still got a little cleanup to do, but the roof is basically complete at this school. Next slide, please. Just some more progress photos of what it looks like. Next slide, please. 
uh, Mountain View Elementary School. So the highlighted areas in yellow on this slide show the areas of roof that we replace. Really all the flat roofs. There are some slope roofed out there that have some some tile shingles on it. Those did not get replaced because they, it wasn't needed at that time. Next slide, please. And you'll see very similar things to what you saw with the slides uh, from the Discovery Canyon campus roof. Uh, some progress photos. Next slide, please. Similar kind of thing. This roof is done as well. Next slide, please. Then we did a, a few sections of roof out at Pine Creek High School. Uh, they're shown with the yellow highlighted areas there. Uh, basically, it was over the music rooms, I believe, a classroom pod, uh, kind of the locker room uh, portion of the cafeteria area. Uh, we're, we're done. Uh, the roofs were replaced there. Next slide, please. And then these are just progress photos of that roof being replaced, uh, different areas, uh, different angles, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. Same, same kind of thing, progress photos. Thank you. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And this is more what it looks like when it's complete. Now, the, the roofs that we did replace out there are completed, uh, so they're done and, and ready to go. Next slide, please. And then Eagle View Middle School. Uh, we're almost complete at that school with the roofing replacement. Same kind of concept here uh, with the slide. Uh, the air and yellows were replaced. Then there's a the the building down in the lower right or excuse me left of that slide. It's kind of shaded a blue. We did some maintenance work on that on the portion of the roof that came up the wall. They call that flashing. So we took the ballast back about four feet, ran new flashing up, and then put the ballast back. So it was kind of more of a maintenance kind of project. Um, next slide, please. And say, similar kind of uh, photos. You'll see that uh, the roof. Uh, is in progress here. Next slide, please. And then there's what it looks like when it's complete. Then Douglas Valley Elementary School. So we're basically replacing the roof over the the gym, cafeteria, the office area, and the little ramp that goes up to the classroom wing. So the classroom wing we are not doing. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a progress photo. Uh, they'll be done with that roof uh, beginning of next week. Okay. Next slide, please. And then Air Academy High School. So there's some some areas of roof that we'll be replacing. They just stock some material up there today and they'll start that on Monday. Uh, it's basically the gym area. There's a small area over the counselor uh, office area and then a couple sections in building D. You can see by the highlighted yellow areas. Those will be replaced. They'll be done with the areas at Air Academy before school starts. Anything that they don't get done, they'll work on the weekends and we'll coordinate that with school. Uh, the other thing out at Air Academy High School that we've been working on quite a bit is to finish up the sanitary sewer line to that little restroom concessions building. Uh, what had occurred there was uh, originally uh, the plan was to tie the sanitary sewer into an existing septic system. And the county wouldn't allow us to do that without giving them a bunch of calculations and resizing that whole septic system. So what we did is we altered the plan and took it into uh, what we call a lift station or a grinder pump and it'll pump up and we tied into the existing sanitary system at the school that only required approval uh, from the United States Air Force Academy, which we received and it just took a little while to get through that process, but they've got most of that line run. Uh, they should finish it up next week. All right, let's get on to the, the fun stuff, now, the renovation remodel projects and what's that? I, if you want to see pipe in the ground, that's great. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's kind of cool stuff. <laughs> All right. All right, next slide, please. All right, so if you've all driven by Pine Creek High School or in that neighborhood, you saw a concrete building kind of appear out of the ground. So what you're going to see here uh, are a variety of progress photos of them setting that concrete structure. It's called precast concrete. Uh, so this was the first panel that they set. Next slide, please. And then you can see uh, these are more panels. So these are panels that are adjacent to the existing uh, south wall, exterior wall of the gymnasium. That was required uh, from a code perspective. They had to have a certain rating there. And then the height of that wall had to be a certain height above the existing one. Next slide, please. Yeah, just some more photos of them setting some concrete panels. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a picture of the roof structure. They're called twin T's. These 
each one of these uh, pieces weighs about 60,000 pounds. They're pretty heavy and big. And it's kind of interesting to watch them move those because they go real slow because they don't want to drop it and have some, some problem with it. It's really neat though. Next slide, please. Same kind of thing, you'll see uh, more progress photos. Next slide, please. Hopefully you're getting the picture of what's going on here. Next slide, please. And this is getting near the end of them having the building in place. Next slide, please. And then uh, the contractor has done, uh, they actually have a, a person that's licensed to do some drone flyovers. So they provided us with a few drone flyovers. Next slide, please. This is just a different angle of that. Next slide, please. And this is what the, the structure looks like when it's fully assembled in place. So where they're at today with that is, uh, as of Tuesday, they had a, a fair amount of the hole excavated for the pool itself. I'm guessing it's done today by today. Uh, yes, any question? I was gonna ask while you're on this picture, can you talk about, I think you might be headed there, but talk about kind of where ground level is in oh, yeah. this picture. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So if you see the openings there, there will be windows there and the the lower opening, the floor level is gonna be just below that. So you can see uh, that that seems up in the air quite a bit. The point of that was inside the structure, they were at that ground level already. So when they dig the hole for the pool, it's not gonna look as uh, uh, dramatic, I should say. Uh, they only had to dig it on the deep end about six or seven feet versus the 12 feet that it will be. Good question. Next slide, please. Okay, then let's talk about the second district stadium at Pine Creek High School. So this is a picture of the foundations in place. Next slide, please. And then the concrete slab for the team room, uh, restroom concessions building. That's a picture of this. Next slide, please. This is the plumbing going in place. Next slide, please. And then there's some retaining wall that's being put in that will retain the, the area up above where the fire lane is. Uh, and then there'll be a concrete slab poured where the bleachers will go. So I was trying to show that in these two pictures. Today that's done. And as of today, the masonry walls for that team room building are up. They're probably up seven, eight foot right now. So they'll be pretty close to being done with that in the next week or so. Next slide, please. And this is just a, one of the drone views from the, that the contractor taken from us, uh, kind of focusing more on the stadium site. Next slide, please. And then document scanning. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as of today, uh, I was told by the vendor that's doing the document scanning that they should finish up the facilities management documents by tomorrow, and then they'll be ready for the district to download. Uh, moving a little slower than I expected, primarily because they've had some manpower issues, but the, ne the next department will be transportation, and then ATR probably, and then payroll, and we'll be scrolling down the line. Next slide, please. Okay, some upcoming work. So uh, if you remember, we started doing a little bit of work on the replacement for the chiller and the cooling tower here in this EAC building. We're gonna crank that up in the winter months. The, the equipment has arrived. I've got a meeting next week to plan out what that's gonna look like. We're probably not gonna tear any of the old equipment out, the existing equipment out, until the temperatures outside get a lot cooler and we feel confident uh, that we're not gonna have comfort issues in this building. Uh, and then the Rampart and Liberty swimming pool equipment upgrades, uh, that'll happen in summer 2023. Uh, we are currently about 70% through design of that. Uh, we plan to replace some more windows as a facilities audit project in the summer of 2023 at Douglas Valley. And then there'll be a few other facilities audit projects that we're currently defining the scope of work and our plan would be to execute those in summer of 2023. Next slide, please. And then some additional projects. Next slide, please. So most of you've seen this. There has been on the CBOC report, a line item for a to build, design and build a cafetorium at Mountain Ridge Middle School. Well, we issued an RP, a RP awarded a contract to the team of Nun Construction and DLR. They're doing some very preliminary design. And then I should get an estimate here, probably in about two or three weeks that I'll know what a budget looks like for that. We're doing something similar for the uh, expansion of the transportation facility, uh, but we're in that re evaluation of the RFP process, so we haven't awarded that. 
And then there's a few other projects listed as possible. The project is funding is available. My current mindset and plan is to have some some good budgetary estimates on those uh, to have some discussions before we bring anything forward to the board uh, so you can make the best decisions possible. Next slide, please. Any questions? Ms. Cons. So thank you so much for all that. With transportation, is it mostly the existing mobile unit that's there? Is it the whole lot that's what's needing to be done? No, so there were four priorities that our okay. director of transportation had spelled out. One is there's a modular building there that has his trainers in it, the yeah. training staff. He would like to get them inside of a real building. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's one priority. Another priority is the there is the maintenance phase where the buses are maintained. Mm -hmm. It's very crowded. There seems to be not enough room for the mechanics to really work as safe as they could. So that'll be another thing that we got to deal with. Uh, he had indicated that he didn't need many more bus parking spaces. So that's still one of his priorities to add a few more, but not a lot. OK, so those are the main priorities that we'll be looking at. Right. We'll follow the same process. My guess is we'll have a variety of different options with different cost estimates for that uh, that we can digest to make better decisions with when we get to that. Okay. Ms. Cons, to remember. Um, uh, so one, the 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 lot was. Redesigned, we'll say the parking areas a few a couple few years ago. Yes, prior to COVID, I think. Uh, so decades ago, um, the uh, and it was restriped. Uh, if you look at it, kind of angular, so there weren't perpendicular spaces. That at that time added the spaces need the parking spaces needed for buses as the district has has grown. Uh, the second thing, if you remember, last spring when Ms. Coldenhoven presented the the moving um, lost the building right. Uh, moving some student programming from the grounds there over to Aspen Valley. Uh, that has all of that was going to be included in expanding a transportation facility to include like classroom type settings and some of that. That no longer needs to happen, but they still need additional space. You've been in the, the room out there that they have, uh, you know, not enough drivers, but still a lot. Uh, and there needs to be a place where they can at least do some meet with staff kinds of things. And I think that will be included in it too. Yes, but. That, that's correct. Uh, when uh, our director of transportation, when I sat down with him and went through those priorities, he said, I really need a little bit more space for everybody that's in the building sure. already. Uh, and when you walk through there, it is very crowded for all his staff to work as effectively as they could. Sure. So the, we don't know what that'll look like yet, but that'll be included. Absolutely. I think there's a side note just as exciting as the roofs and sanitary right. sewer systems uh i think there might be a number of restrooms or okay. i don't know commodes yeah. uh by code that need to be addressed too mm -hmm. okay and then just one more question that might be for either of mr gregory or you mr garnhart um with the pine creek football stadium is there going to be seating on both sides or just that east side no it'll just be the east side and it'll seat about 700 that was my uh, other people okay uh, and the whole intent was it's a smaller venue for uh, activities where there will be smaller spectator attendance okay. such as soccer okay. uh, field hockey lacrosse jv games it probably won't be able to host varsity football. okay that was kind of my intent with the question is are we going to be seeing schedules split for all the high schools to for varsity to be so playing just for there? yeah probably not okay. just for relativity for everybody i'm put you on the spot chris but do you know the seating capacity at district 20 state yeah it's about four four thousand wow. so, so that kind Got of it. Thank you. relatively that's 700 to, to four thousand well it's beautiful regardless of how many seats okay thank you Mr. Tembe. Chris, you mentioned the pool being done in the spring. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that available for community and district use that'll, starting summer next year? Or, uh, well, that'll be up to the school and how they, they organize that. Yeah. I will tell you that the, the critical path is the electrical transformer that provides electrical power to that building. Uh, that comes from Carl Springs Utilities and it's not scheduled to arrive till near the end of April. Uh, when that got that order got placed. It was a 52 week lead item. Wow. In current day, they're out 68 weeks. Wow. 
And when I talked to the gentleman at Carl Springs Utilities a couple weeks ago, he had indicated to me that they only have one other transformer of that size in their inventory that they have to keep for emergency replacement uses in their existing infrastructure. Uh, so that's really the you know, going to be the key. So is fall of 2023 safe? <laughs> as far as I can tell you, yes. Uh, so we'll see how that, that that works out. I my guess is the city will be able to to accommodate us at the end of April. Great, thanks for the update. Just a quick question. Um, the roofs that are being replaced, how long did they last and how long do we think the new roofs? I know they're they're not all identical, but how long do we think those new roofs will last? Actually, the roofing system that we are putting on all those roofs are identical and they have a 20 year life. On them. OK, how long did the old ones, the ones that got replaced, when were those replaced? Some are more original to the building, so probably 25, 30 years in some cases. OK, that makes some, does that answer your question. And board, anything else? Thank you, Mr. Garner. I appreciate it. Thank you. Monitor term report. Um, we monitor operational performance. So these are executive limitations. Um, we are now going to talk about monitor report for executive limitation policy 2.1 treatment of students. Mr. Gregory. Dr. Smith. Please. All right. Thank you. I'm going to tell Chris. Great job. Those are exciting pictures for sure. Um, I'm not sure what a grinder is, a sewage grinder, but uh, probably doesn't sound, don't want to know, really, right? All right, good evening. It's my pleasure to share with you this year's EL 2.1 Treatment of Students Monitoring Report. Because this report touches upon so many different areas of responsibility, it truly is the work of the, the full cabinet, and I'd like to take a quick second to recognize them. So if I get a round of applause for the cabinet, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Excuse me, for the opportunity, right? Throughout this report, I'll highlight each policy provision statement and how each one of them has been addressed to guarantee that the superintendent is in compliance. The first policy provision statement, and you've received this report in your in your packet, addresses the handling of student information. Because we've adopted and implemented the Colorado State Records Retention Manual, all information is retained in accordance with the guidance of that manual. And I think it's important to note too that during the monitoring period, there were no complaints filed with the U.S. Department of Education alleging a FERPA violation. The second provision statement addresses corporal punishment. As you're aware, Policy JKA physical intervention forbids administration of corporal punishment, and the superintendent and his staff have ensured compliance with this policy. Further, all staff engage in training throughout the year, each year, to make sure that they understand the expectations in this area. And as indicated in the report, all concerns about physical contact have been investigated and addressed individually by our human resources department. And during this monitoring period, we did have 10 instances of physical contact that were investigated. However, none of them were instances of corporal punishment. Mr. Gregory has kept the board informed about all of these instances. The third policy provision statement addresses the school boundary changes. No boundary changes have been made since October 19th, 2017, when the Board of Education approved the recommendations by the Boundary Committee. The recently adopted boundaries are currently being utilized without revision. The fourth provision statement speaks to our crisis management and safety efforts. Safe Schools Policy ADD directs the superintendent to develop a safe schools plan. The district has developed and implemented this plan, which indicates that fire drills are exercised on a monthly basis and lockdown exercises are conducted every semester. Additionally, a tornado drill, hopefully you'll have to, never have to use it, is exercised each semester and every school updates their plans annually. All district buildings are required to post evacuation and weather shelter, shelter, shelter routes in every classroom. The fifth provision statement asks the superintendent to ensure that students are informed of disciplinary policies and practices, graduation requirements, and college entrance prerequisites. We speak in this report the ways that we ensure that students and their families are informed and prepared. Student handbooks are used universally to share information about disciplinary policies and practices, while our individual career and academic plans, or ICAPs, are used to engage families in conversation about their graduation requirements and future career paths. The sixth provision statement asks the superintendent to ensure that students use technology appropriately. As you have read in this report, we have many safeguards in place, and those safeguards have resulted in school partnerships with IT to ensure effective response to any inappropriate activity. Further, all access to the, throughout the district is password protected. And Academy District 20 adheres to SEPA filtering requirements, and SEPA stands for 
Children's Internet Protection Act. The seventh provision statement speaks to the importance of recognizing student achievement and accomplishments. This is an important focus of all educators throughout the district and during the monitoring period, Mr. Gregory, Gregory regularly celebrated student achievements by sending personal notes to them and mentioning achievements of students during administrative comments at board meetings to name just a few. The eighth provision statement addresses communication practices that ensure complete parent and student understanding of district services. We continue to be in compliance in this area as our efforts are focused on hearing stakeholder voices and ensuring that they are aware of our direction. District and school websites, newsletters, and e-communicator, 20 alerts, and parent academies are some of the communication tools that we've used to consistently and proactively communicate with our community. During the monitoring period, <clears throat> task force work to support the newly implemented strategic plan involves students, staff, and parents. The ninth provision statement is similar to the pr previous one and as, as it addresses the need for communication and ensuring that policies are in place should complaints be filed. As you're aware, all policies are linked to the district's website and are highlighted in other places like student handbooks. Finally, the 10th provision statement, the final one, speaks to the consideration for and importance of student input. We continue to add student to task force and committees as they form throughout the district. During the 2021-22 school year, students serve on the data-driven decision-making task force, as well as the student voice and culture of belonging task forces. In addition, the superintendent's student advisory council is a venue where student Students speak directly to the superintendent as he seeks their feedback. The human resources department includes high school students on preliminary assistant principal and principal interview teams. This year, the district conducted multiple preliminary interview processes that included students. What questions do you have for me? Mr. Saul. Thank you. Uh, this is not so much a question, just as a little bit of commentary here that I want to talk about. Uh, number 2.1.10 here, the student input. Talk about, I know we've talked a lot about student voice and the importance of that across. And I just wanted to, again, commend uh, Mr. Gregory here with his, he's got the student advisory group uh, that brings students from across the district in. And going to the graduations, it was a lot of fun watching him be able to call students out by name of the graduations. And, you know, they stood up and they got recognized. And uh, it was really cool seeing their, contribution to the district and the relationship that they're able to build with uh, with Mr. Gregory. And so I just wanted to comment on that and, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, the last page is page seven of eight. Was there was something left off or was it just? No, just a pagination error. OK, no worries. I just want to make sure we didn't miss a page. Um, thank you, Dr. Smith. All right, thank you. And just a, a quick little update for the listening audience. Th these are um, their executive limitations. Mr. Gregory is our is the executive that this applies to. If you notice, they're always sort of negative. He will not. And these I, I call these guardrails that we put on um, the superintendent. Say so you can you can do these things, but you can't go outside of these things. So in case you're wondering, those are the policies that that are directly to the superintendent and we call them limitations because we limit what the superintendent can do in case you're wondering. Okay, the next one is monitoring report for executive limitation policy 2.6. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you. We have an MRE monitoring report evaluation. My apologies. Um, this is for treatment of students. Is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance or concerns regarding performance. Uh, would you like to see additional or different evidence or should any part of this policy be changed in the next reporting cycle? Do you see any evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? So no, no comments on the MRE. OK, thank you, Ms. Matson. Yeah, yeah, that, that's reasonable, I think. Yeah, thank you. Let's put that in. OK. Um, next one is, uh, again, uh, 2.6 financial planning and budgeting, EL 2.6. Mr. Gregory. Ms. Allen, please. Good evening. Good evening. I am here this evening to present the monitoring report for EL 2.6, which is financial planning and budgeting and it starts on July 1 of 2021 
and it ended June 30 of 2022. It spanned our fiscal year. This EL states that financial planning for any fiscal year shall not deviate materially from the Board of Education's ends, the policies. It should not risk fiscal jeopardy to the district or fail to be derived from a multi-year plan. More specifically, there are seven policy provision statements. Basically, it requires, and it's interesting that Mr. Lavalley just mentioned, they tend to be listed in the negative. I'm gonna give it in the positive. So the expectation is that our superintendent requires a clear and well-communicated budget and budget process, requires a budgeting process that provides historic data, meaning budgeted, actual, projected revenues and expenditures for each fund, it requires that I disclose or that the superintendent disclose to you what the assumptions are that are building the foundation for that budget. It requires that more resources are not spent than what's actually available to spend. It requires an unassigned fund balance amount between four and 12% of our budgeted expenditures. And it requires board approval if the budget projects to reduce our year-end fund balance by more than 5%. The monitoring report provides data for each one of these policy provision statements. And a summary of that is that our budget document that was prepared does conform with state laws. It reflects our GAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles and GASB standards, which are the governmental accountant standards board standards. It has historical and current data. It projects future revenue and expenditures, all of which are based upon conservative assumptions that really tend to underestimate the revenue and overestimate our expenses. It's organized and easy to read, and it includes important contextual information about our business, if you will, as a school district in terms of our economy, demographics, it has student performance in information, et cetera. Just one provision that I'm going to highlight for a moment, and then I'll take any questions that you have, is the seventh and final provision statement, which is shown on page six of your packet. This provision says that uh, the superintendent is not allowed to present a budget that projects to reduce the year-end fund balance by more than 5% without board approval. Here's what that means. If you were to imagine at the beginning of a fiscal year, the unassigned fund balance is $100. Well, we can't, unless the board were involved with that, present any other type of budget that would be $94 or lower because 5% of 100 is $5. So 99 is good, 98 is good, all the way to 95 is good. Once you hit $94, 100 has been reduced by 6% to get to $94. So in order for that policy provision statement to still be in compliance, the board would have had to have been involved in that process. So when we look at our 22-23 adopted budget, here are the numbers, not my corny $100 analogy, but the actual numbers. We have a beginning fund balance in, in this current year budget of $27.7 million. The ending is projected at 25.7. That's a difference, a decline of 2 million. When you do that on a percentage basis, it's just over 7%. So we're over the 5% threshold. But because that was something that was a part of the adopted budget process that the board was a part of, then it's considered still being certainly that that policy provision statement is in compliance. As you can see from the report, we certainly believe that Mr. Gregory complied with EL 2.6 and each of its seven policy provision statements. Before I close and take any questions, I just would like to thank Brian Cortez, Kathy Watts for their good work on this report. Any questions for me? Mr. Temby. Uh, just a comment, uh, our budget presentation is one of the finest I've seen. Um, and I think the public taxpayers should appreciate our fiscal transparency. Uh, everything's on the website and you're certainly uh, available for any questions. And so the lineage uh, from Mr. Gregory to you has been exceptional and appreciate your stewardship. 
Thank you. And I will share those kind words with my teammates as well. Thank you. Mr. Stahl. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the explanation. I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to, to do a quick call out on the, the first one where we talk about this budget going towards uh, you know board ends and that we talk a lot about the ends and I just want to make a comment about the fact that we're referencing that here and putting it as a priority in our budget, making sure that the dollars we go, we do go towards those ends. So it's not just that we talk about achieving those ends, but we actually are putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. So thank you for all the work that you've done. Yeah, good, good comment. I just want to say, and I, Mr. Gregory and Ms. Allen, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't recall us ever having the ending fund balance dropping more than 5%, at least since I've been on the board in the last five years. Is, can, I don't from think a, it's happened. From a budgeting standpoint, budgeting. it's pretty common. Is that we yes. drop that much? Yes, for a little bit of perspective. From a budget standpoint, from a budget, not an actual. Not actual, and this is looking at budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by budget standards, we the, the three that I've presented to you in the past all exceeded. It was 24.3%, uh, 6%, 13%. But again, it's budget. And quite often when we have our audited balances, then it it closes that gap. It ends up going back up. And correct me if I'm wrong, but we're being more careful this time to not assume the the worst, the um, worst case budget. Uh, am I correct on that, or are we still sort of planning every single uh, uh, employee is is filled? We are still doing that. However, remember a year ago when when uh, the discussion was about an additional one time payment, and we talked about how we really dug in. Kathy Bryan did great work to say you know what, we think we're not going to spend uh, $3 million in salaries that we had budgeted for. And remember, we've talked about seeing that kind of each year over yeah. the last few years. So we reduced that salary expenditure by that amount. So what that does is, in the past, that $3 million has kind of been there, if you will, and we're taking that out as an expense. Sort of like almost a buffer, so if you will. it's tightening up. Um, those numbers and reducing the buffer a bit. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. So I, I'm not going to get down in the weeds, but maybe we can put this as a work session topic if, if the board chooses. But one of the challenges with uh, timing really is um, trying to figure out how to say it succinctly each year. So let's just say the 22 23 budget, the current budget we're in, was built last spring. So this budget was built on uh, a set of assumptions that included an assumption for an ending fund balance. We don't even know what that real number is until we get to November when the audit is presented. And then it creates the new assumption for the next year. So essentially a budget is built on an assumption of an assumption. So the bullseye is, is really tough now because you're building assumptions on top of assumptions uh, and it's just it's cyclical like that every year. That's why I think it's really important in the monthly financials to always look at the actuals where we are this year compared to the prior year. Because if the prior year was we're in pretty good shape regardless of what the budget was and we compare what's happening this year two years prior and it's fairly consistent, uh, you know, 70 to 80% of our budget is salaries and benefits. Um, so, you know, the, unless we have a lot of vacant positions, which we have realized over the last couple of years, it's pretty consistent. But we can talk about the assumptions built on assumptions, maybe at a work session, but but it's it's a matter of the, the timing or the law of the farm, if you will, when you put state law on top of, you know, state statute timeline requirements on top of, um, when they pass the School Finance Act and some of that, it makes it makes some things really challenging, uh, Mr. Lavalley. And again, I, I won't go any further than that, but maybe at a work session we can talk about that that weirdness of uh, that you know the projection of twenty five million dollars. I can tell you right now that's not going to happen. It's going to be more than that. And there's, it, I also think about it. And I, I like that answer, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I think about it, you know, when they do a, a hurricane forecast, right? And it's a week out. They have that cone of uncertainty. Yeah. Well. 
you know, as you get closer and closer, as we move closer to November and then the mid-year budget, we bring that in. That $3 million reduction tightened us up a little bit. It actually is helping us to zoom in on our target a little bit more so that we're able to make those resources available during the budget process instead of waiting until the back end to know, oh, we had it again. Yeah. Hope that $3 million was available. We're trying to say we're very we're pretty confident it's going to be there so let's let's act on that assumption and of course the student count doesn't occur till october which is where our revenue is based on student count so um yeah very good thank you anything else board thank you miss allen uh mre for el 2.6 is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance or concerns regarding performance? What's that? Noted. Uh, noted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, would you like to see additional or different evidence or should any part of this policy be changed in the next reporting cycle? Do you see evidence which is extraneous no longer necessary? Very good. Thank you. Next one is the superintendent's reports and resolutions hiring report, Mr. Gregory. Yes, Mr. Smart, please. You know, I had to follow Becky who talked about hurricanes and now I'm talking about the hiring report. So here you go. Uh, forecast is a little better than maybe maybe predicted. So as you saw, we had uh, over, I don't know, well, almost about 300 folks there at our new licensed staff orientation. So that's good. It's not, you know, it's not perfect forecast, but it's better than what we may have anticipated a few weeks ago. So the other thing I would like to do is thank Sorry, my team. Mr. Smart. Yeah. Can we check your mic level? It check, is, check. There you go. It's a little bit low. You know, I can't I can't do anything. To I, I, hold on. Let me take my shoes off. Let me take No. I tried raising it. It's up as high as it goes. I'm just Sorry. gonna have to hover over this. You're just way too tall. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to uh Thank my team, the HR department. Uh, they have been working extremely hard. Uh, as you know, all applications come to our department and they have to go through those and then screen those first and then get them out to hiring managers, whether it be admin or department managers. And they are uh, working very hard to make sure we're as efficient as possible. And then after they get selected, they come back to us for us to finish the hiring process. So just wanna thank them for their efforts. And I think we can go to the next slide. So uh, obviously hiring is one of the most important responsibilities of, of any admin principal supervisor in our district. One of the things we always ensure is that we have uh, three professional reference checks uh, from previous supervisors and um, that per EL 2.3 treatment of staff that they all meet the background checks uh, before we move forward with anybody. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a little out of date because this uh, was pulled on July 20th. So at that time, it was about 293 teachers that we had um, had hired at that at that point. We were over that now. 67 of those teachers were on what we call INR contracts from last year. So that was a temporary contract that was not guaranteed to continue. We brought those back there now on a regular contract. And then 21 of those folks are either transitioning, they're um, you know retiring, but they're doing a transition year, or they are retirees that we've reached out to or have reached out to us and said, hey, I'd like to, to get back in the game a little bit. Cameron, can you say exactly what INR is for yeah. folks? Uh, intent not to return is what that um, stands for, which means that uh, when we offer a contract on, on an INR, it's explained that this is um, that there's no intent that you're going to return next year in that position. Uh, it's a basically a temporary position at that point. Though, I, I don't know what to say often, but maybe it is often we actually hire them back, but there's absolutely no guarantees. It's really a one-year contract it is. is what it is. And yeah. as you can see, we I mean, that's probably, I'd have to look at averages, but uh, we do hire a lot of those folks back on a regular contract the next year. Sometimes it's just the timing of when that INR contract is offered that we may have already started the school year. And so because of that, they're on an INR for that year um, or it could be, there's other circumstances that require us to, to offer that kind of contract. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, can I ask? Uh, sure. So, so go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so with the INRs, are those typically offered to people like mid-year or do we offer those at some point before the year starts? We have, we have a cutoff of when we, like for right now, any new position that's a licensed position is going to be um, 
posted as of August 1st is going to be an INR. Uh, any existing position that's already been posted but hasn't been filled yet it, uh, after uh, August 8th it will be uh, considered an INR. So if it gets filled after that point. And then we do have some that, uh, you know, later in the year if something happens that we need to hire somebody. Yeah. Yep. And you can kind of see um, kind of where we've hired staff at elementary 110. And these are licensed staff. So that includes teachers, um, uh, SSPs. Uh, those folks. Uh, secondary, we've hired 163. K-12 is really any of those folks that kind of fall into like OT, PT, school psychologists that kind of work at all levels. And that's uh, about 20 folks in that in that realm. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this number is a little bit off now because it's a little bit, it's not quite as many. That said 54 full-time uh, licensed staff and 17 part-time. We've actually is a little bit less than that now. As you know, we do have some of our licensed positions that are uh, part-time or less than full-time. So, this is the part that's our challenge. Yeah. Right. I, we just said earlier. Next week, returning teachers come back. The week after that, students come back, and the environment and or the shortage of of teachers out there are are really problematic. And it's not just a District 20 issue. Um, it's 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 all over the place. Uh, I just a uh, if you don't mind, Mr. Schmidt, a quick statistic that um, was, and I, I apologize, but I can't cite the source because I didn't, I didn't catch it. But uh, last week at Case, this was uh, a, a hot topic across all school districts in Colorado. Um, the uh, one example, if you take all of the colleges and universities in Colorado, private, public, doesn't matter, all of them in Colorado. Uh, I won't make you answer, but just in your mind, how many do you think, uh, how many uh, uh, folks graduated? I don't know if it in includes the Air Force Academy, sir. I, I doubt that it does. Uh, that might throw off my numbers, but um, how many folks graduated with a math degree? Just in your head. Uh, just total number. Yeah, not enough. That's the answer. But uh, um, I believe if I if I remember right, the number was 80. 8 zero. Um, the number of math teaching positions. So forget about all the other industries, by the way. This is just math degrees, not math degrees for teachers, but math degrees of those 80. You know how many stayed in Colorado after they graduated? 50 percent. So now we're down to 40. Uh, and if if I can guarantee you just in the Pikes Peak area, there were probably 40 math teachers needed. So, you know, forget about the large Denver districts, any of that. That is an example of of the issue we're dealing with. And it's really uh, the STEM areas, math, science for sure. And then um, our, our biggest challenge because math and science aren't driven by federal law. Uh, still a problem, but there's not law behind it, uh, is special education uh, because that is driven by law uh, and there are uh, a desperate need of all kinds of special educators across Colorado. I don't have a statistic like I did for math, um, but it tells the story of of what the situation is and it's incredibly challenging. Sorry, Mr. Smart. No, that's that that just brings light to the, the difficulty we're in right now. And, and again, not just us, everybody's in the same boat. Uh, and actually, so that number right there is, was what, about 71. We're down to about 55 total uh, licensed uh, uh, vacancies. So we've kind of dropped that number down a little bit as of today. Uh, next slide, please. And I believe the real problem is some of those uh, have zero applicants. Yeah. So, you know, that's the that's the challenge is if we had a few applicants, you have some, I'll use the word hope. Uh, I don't know if hope's the right word or not, but uh, when you have zero applicants for some of these positions, that's, that's a real challenge. Yeah, and that's what we're running to at this point. Um, as you can see, we had um, 24 of our District 20 graduates that we hired, uh, 40 District 20 student teachers. So these were teachers or interns that were with us last year, uh, completing their student teaching that we hired into the district. Uh, again, 67 teachers that were in INR last year. 57 of our teachers of the almost 300 that we hired were beginning, so that means brand new first year, didn't have any experience. Uh, five uh, new teachers were classified staff members with us, so they had been in a classified position in a, in a 
past year or last year, and now they are now a teacher for us. So that's good. We're being able to kind of build our own and grow our own a little bit. 35 from out of state or another country, most of those out of state. Um, last year, I think we had 36, and in a couple of years, the last few years before that, we had about 20 plus per year. So on average, about 28 of our uh, teachers seem to be coming from out of state. Um, we did do some recruiting out of state this, uh, this year. We went to several job fairs um, outside of Colorado. We were able to get a few teachers uh, in, by going out and looking for those folks. And then 164 have a master's degree and five of those teachers or licensed staff have doctorate degrees. Mr. Smart, if I may, the 164, that's out of the 293. Yeah. That's an impressive number yeah. when you think about that. I, I just, just a comment and, and five doctorates uh, out of 293. I, I think those are impressive numbers. Yeah, and I think you notice even last year, I think we saw the same kind of trend. We have a lot of teachers that we've hired that have to have that experience, you know, more than more than five years. So we've got a lot of folks that have been in the teaching pipeline for a while. Uh, next slide. And this just kind of tells you where uh, our beginning teachers got some of their degrees from. Obviously, a lot of them from Colorado, uh, 50, and then a few other states. Surprise, we don't have any Wyoming ones up there, but in, next year I'll get some. Say Kansas, uh, that's not up there either. All right, next slide, please. Uh, this just kind of shows you uh, some of our graduates that uh, used to go to school here who are now teaching for us. And so the next few slides are just who they are, what school they uh, attended, or what school they're at now, and what subject they're teaching. So um, from Air Academy, you can see those are the, the students from there. And it's, it's great to see our students come back um, and, and join our district now as teachers um, after going through the system. Next slide. And Discovery Canyon. And then we'll get more from them. And then Liberty. Next slide. Pine Creek had a lot as well. Uh, next slide. Rampart. Okay. And classified, uh, we've hired at that point again, this was July 20, 67 classified staff hired. A lot of our classified because of the fact that we have that break where they're, we're not in school. And a lot of our positions for classified are when students are here. A lot of the hiring for classified happens right now because it's, if we hire somebody at the end of uh, in the May, beginning of June, they don't start for two months. Sometimes it's hard to keep them around because they're like, well, I don't, I'm not earning a paycheck now for two more months. So that has been ramped up now since principals have come back from their summer break. And we expect that to continue to go up again. You know, finding uh, some candidates for some of our positions is still proving to be a little difficult. Next slide. And this just kind of shows administrators uh, kind of, and that actually we had two more on there that aren't on the list we, as we had some APs tonight. Uh, shows you how many uh, vacancies we had. So you can see we did a lot of hiring in the admin area this year. And then the average number of applicants uh, per position there. Um, next slide. I can say so many questions. Mr. Tembe. So Mr. Smart, um, there are certainly headwinds out there. Um, what's the consensus of your peers? Is this going to be a struggle at the same level next year? Or are we really getting into some dire straits out there in terms of pipeline, retention, yeah. uh, all those issues? What, 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 I think it's all. I, this is a non binding question, by the yeah, way. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we believe we're still in the middle of trying to get uh, it turned around. Um, we, we feel like the pipeline is a big issue, you know, getting folks uh, um, believing and encouraged to say that. Education is where they want to be, and that the impact they can have in education. I feel education is obviously um, a great career, but helping people to see that. Um, and then uh, our own resources we have here. How can we grow our own folks? How can we take, uh, like you said, with classified staff that want to become teachers, how can we help uh, with that process? Uh, student teachers, encouraging student teachers to come into our district and stay with our district uh, after they complete their assignment. Um, what other factors could we do to draw people uh, not only to um, the district, but 
um, to specific positions in our district, special education being one of those, math, science, those kind of things. Uh, I don't think we're out of the woods, and I think uh, not. I'm not. You know, I can't do a forecast say it'll be better or worse next year, but I think we have to be aggressive in our approach to how we retain and recruit. Yeah. Any epiphanies from this year, this year's process? Because at this point, you're really stealing market share too, right? We are. We're all fishing in the same pond. Yeah, and and so yeah. differentiators for this district yeah. couldn't be more important. Right in terms of how we value the profession, how we take care of them. We walk the talk mm -hmm. from a leadership standpoint uh, at the site-based, uh, with a site-based model. So uh, it's it's critical. This is, mm -hmm. nothing's more important than what's going on in our classrooms right now. Yep. And I tell you, one of the things I would like to thank communications as well. We have, uh, even last year when we started, as we geared up for our job fair in, in March, we continue to work with them to help promote the vacancies we have, the increases in salaries, increases in, in uh, classified wages, uh, to get the word out. Because uh, oftentimes we, we may think everybody knows, but you know if you're not out there looking, and some people don't always look to education specifically as one of classified roles, and then all of a sudden if we can get the word out, like, oh, hey, I didn't think of that, that might be a good place for me to be. Um, that's another thing we're trying to do. I think we we had a little bit of communication go out, and I believe we have more coming out in the next few weeks. We also do have another job fair that we're going to do on, on August 27th. That'll be both for li licensed and classified as well. Mr. Timmy, if I if I may, I don't want to. I think that's a that's an essential question. Uh, yeah, and I'll the first part of your question kind of is how long, right? Is this? I, I I'm my worry is that it's longer than a couple years because the pipeline that we're talking about is a, the traditional path uh, is a four year degree. And we know uh, we, uh, doc, Dr. Field and Dr. Smith and I last week, two weeks ago, sometime recently, uh, met with the commissioner of higher education in Colorado uh, remotely um, and shared we, we kind of took our time to share our concerns around our colleges producing teachers. Now they don't have total control over that either because it's choice. And that's where I would start my comments off is until people start choosing, until our young people out of high school start choosing to be in the field of education, it's going to be a problem. Um, you know, and I'm not even, the math example I gave was a content area uh, of those 40 folks that are left in Colorado, 35 of them may not have chosen to go the education route. They may have went another route. Um, so until folks start choosing, and then we can start discussing root causes for their choices, if 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 so. But we probably don't have that much time. I just think it's a it's a longer problem. What have we done? Um, there is, you know, a communications campaign. Um, we the the board. Uh, you know, did some, uh, you know, I would say, I would use the word aggressively address some of the salary components. It's not the fix. I think it's one step of many that we need to take. I, I know, readily admit that not everybody in this community is 100% behind a strategic plan, but we sat with 300 people uh, yesterday, uh, well, throughout the day when we rotated through. Um, now these people had already committed to come here, but you know what caught their attention the most? was the value for people. And a lot of these folks didn't come out of college to us. They came from other places. And their comments, and Allison may, or Jim were in the same room I was. Um, uh, if, if I'm wrong, then please speak up. But many of the comments I heard was, wow, it's nice to hear uh, on the first day of orientation that people are the heart of your success. That phrase was risen up many times from folks who came from districts, neighboring districts, I'll just leave it at that, uh, or other districts out of the state. That was the first thing that that kind of captured them. So as a different, uh, I would say one of the differentiators we have, now we got to live it and we got to show it, uh, but one of the differentiators we have is simply that, right? Our ends are about knowledge, skills, and character. There's no doubt about it, but how we get there, we can't do it without people uh, and we can't do it without, I won't say the right people, but good people. 
uh, good people that are good teachers. So uh, there's many aspects. I will even I'm going to say this. We've investigated in Colorado, outside of Colorado, outside and of potentially even wider than that um, outside of the United States uh, uh, to try to find uh, the best people for our kids in our classrooms. But there are some real challenges and we don't control all of it, right? We can do as much as we can, but um, I think it's that first piece is our high school, you know, we call it the teacher cadet program where high school students can start down the path of, of entering the field of teaching while they're in high school. And we even brought that up with the commissioner of higher education is, you know, how, how can we do a better job with that even, that transition from, essentially our question was, can't colleges recognize what we're trying to do uh, in high schools and give some of those kids a bit of an advanced start maybe with some college credit for some of this stuff uh, because we're also competing with universities across the world that don't require a four-year degree it's a three-year degree um, in, in other in other countries so there's a it's a multi-faceted um, uh, issue uh, that's really tough to get our arms around and I will say that um, you know it's it's, it's new frankly for for district 20 um, this has been an issue for other districts for quite a while it's now reached um, district 20 where we've always said we're a destination district we're attractive um, but that's not enough anymore there's got to be other elements so i'll stop there thank you well there's a saying um, uh, deeds not words and so I, it's so critical with our um, strategic plan to to really live that every day and it's hard it's hard to do that every day and to, to show that is a differentiator for us. But thanks for all your efforts, uh, Cameron, to you and your team and to everybody who was part of the hiring process. It's uh, yeoman work. So thank you. Ms. Collinger. I have a lot of thoughts about this and I'm just going to be brief tonight, but um, I just want to acknowledge that um, this board does not have one single educator sitting on it um, as far as the five elected. Um, and I think that that is also something that's maybe a little disheartening to those educators who are listening and who are in the district to be the walk the walk kind of a thing. So with that acknowledgement, I just want to let the educators who are in this district recognize that I, I believe that, and I can only speak for myself obviously, that I need to continually be educated myself about what their frontline um, issues are. I recognize that this is not a, a easy, um, an easy fix or that there is, you know, a whole group of people that um, are not in going into this profession. And I would say that um, the way that we treat our teachers and not just during the week of Educators Week, but the fact that there are so many parents that attack them is a really dangerous thing for our, our um, securing those positions. And so I guess I would just say from, in my opinion, as we go out through the next um, few weeks of starting school is find ways to support our teachers and to encourage them to do the work that th we know that they're there to do. Um, and I think we have amazing educators and I'm grateful for them. I wondered also with the fact that we have INR positions, how it works with already hiring long-term subs instead of INR, because I know that that's happened and I don't understand why, I mean, is it qualifications? Is it, why would we be going that route um, first off? Um, I worry about the level of education that some of, especially our higher, um, you know, our, our seniors and and uh, high school kids are going to be getting and I, I don't mean to to put this on a on a you know negative spin but it is a concern I think you know MLOs and things like that those are all really important to the trajectory of this district any other uh, Ms. Cons? thank you Mr. Smart for the report <clears throat> with our vacancies, which are hopefully less than 71 now, like you said, a few, what does that mean immediately for the students coming back? Yeah, well, we uh, actually at our lead, our return lead team retreat, we uh, actually had each uh, level, uh, so elementary, middle, and high school, 
met with each other as colleagues to kind of talk about what each of them are trying to do to mitigate that, so whether that's reaching out to uh, retirees to say, hey, would you be willing, to leave, even for a semester, to, to come in, uh, looking at is there any way to condense what they have to, you know, um, make, you know, classes maybe a little larger, but then they could have an additional staff to use. Uh, looking at subs, is that an option? Uh, putting things out to their community, we did ask them to put out to their their individual communities from them. You know, here's the vacancies we still have. Here's you know starting pay, just to try to really um, see if there's anybody in their own community that may they had any relations still had a need. And um, so uh, as we hire subs, we're looking at that as well. So some of that is you know do the subs have the qualification to be in there, um, and that's what we're always trying to do is match up. Make sure if it's uh, English that that person has some sort of English background that will help facilitate that that person being able to go there. So we're looking at all options. Okay, thank you, Mr. Salt. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Smart. I just wanted to highlight uh, the graphs that you had of the Academy District 20 students that came out. I think that was great, and so I appreciate you putting that together for me. It was a really fun few slides to look at. I did have, a, and, and I may have missed it, but do, did, were you able to, or did you capture, I think we did this in years past, the, per, the number of teacher applicants per hire? Did you, if you didn't, that's fine. Here's what I can tell you. It's, it's very difficult to, like by level, by elementary, middle, and high school. So I can tell you this year we had um, a little over almost 1,040 individual candidates apply for positions. Now that means they may have applied for multiple positions. So I may have had one candidate put out five or six applic applications because they may have said, okay, there's a there's a teaching position at this school, this school, this school, so I'm gonna apply for all those five schools. So one applicant could have multiple applications. Uh, that is down about almost 300 from last year. So total number of candidates, individual candidates that have applied to our district is down about th almost 300. So that's also one of the reasons we're seeing that there's an issue is we just, don't have quite the same number as we have in the past. And we have a few more positions than last year to fill. So it's kind of a negative both ways in that sense. How long has the teacher cadet program at DCC been around? I don't think it's been long enough to, to if you will, generate a college graduate. I don't th think, does it? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's not been that long yeah, uh, to yeah. get somebody all the way through college and then ready, ready to teach. Um, but I know it was, a, I, and I, I spoke there couple of years ago, I think it was, it just seems like a, a wonderful program they actually asked to talk about. They want to hear somebody to talk about what the board is and what we do. I just, just thinking out loud, it, it, and I'm not advocating, I'm just wondering, is there any thought of doing that perhaps at any of the other high schools? I don't know. I can tell you that HR has talked about how could we increase that program through other schools as well. One of the, one of the dilemmas this creates, so this is an example, right? Kind of follows Ms. Khan's question just now too is you know the the growth of a program um find the right words growing a the decision to grow a program is based on participation mm -hmm. right wow we got a you know overflowing program at dcc let's grow it to other schools or other opportunities we're not at that point um and we're also not at a point where principals have the flexibility within their staffing to run a class that might have eight students even though there are eight students who want to be teachers but if we don't have the flexibility a principal says no i i can't do that because i need you know this other class that has 30 students in it to run i can't allow a class to eight to go so we it's all of those balancing components that, that principals are having to do but we'd love to uh, i would tell you this the other you know we always talk about college you know students matriculating through college to become teachers um i found out this week in talking to you know some of the folks who uh were at the the new teacher event um some of their frustrations which we will follow up on too and they were career changes uh finished a career um want to change career, whatever it is but the process in colorado for um, you know, somebody who's worked in a career for 20, 25 years, uh, have an expertise, uh, have the background, have the education, all of that stuff. Um, it's really challenging in Colorado for them to jump right into teaching. Um, and that's 
we don't have control over that, but I can assure you that's something that I've started talking about uh, and we'll continue to talk about. And if we can control some of that, help that a little bit, even locally within our school district, um, then we'll do whatever we can to make it easier for folks to transition from one career, from a non-education career into teaching um, and make that as seamless as possible too, because it's another um, it's another avenue, right? It's and and we see that our you've heard people say that it's you know the 300 folks approximately or 250 folks that were sitting in that room, the average age was not 23, not even close. Um, so you know maybe that's the next uh, uh, I don't know market or pool of folks we need to uh, attack or attract, and and that's the just career changes. Uh, military possibly also veterans there's programs maybe we need to look more into you know veterans after a military career and make it again it's that process of you know having to check all the boxes before you can teach with a license maybe there's ways to to um, you know do something about that too board anything else thank you mr cameron uh, mr cameron mr smart <laughs> whatever you want to call me i have a lot of names thank you Board was this was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills and character necessary for successful transition to next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. This meeting.